Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. In today's episode, we are taking a look at some scary phenomena that people have witnessed and still can't explain to this day. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I was generally a brave kid, but a truck scared me half to death. When I was 13, my family moved to a house in the PNW. We lived next to a large wooded area that eventually led to a quarry. I explored every inch of those woods and absolutely loved it, though sometimes I would get randomly creeped out, like someone was watching me. One day, I was exploring and noticed a deer trail I hadn't been down yet. It led down to a low, flat area surrounded by boulders and hills. The first thing I found was a complete deer skeleton, completely bleached white, at the base of a big tree. Being a bit of a bone collector, I poked around a bit and decided I'd stop for the skull on my way back. I continued into the low area, and the trees started to thin out, and in a small clearing was a very old red pickup truck. I don't know cars well, but they were very dirty and had big, rounded out Will Wells like cars in the 1960s. I can't explain why, but when I saw the truck, my curiosity was quickly overwhelmed by a sense of immense dread and danger. I stopped dead in my tracks and just stood there for a moment, trying to figure out what the heck was scaring me so badly. I knew there weren't any predators that could hurt me in the area, and I hadn't heard any noises or seen any other signs of people. I was in these woods all the time and never saw signs of people until the truck. I ended up turning around and leaving at a controlled pace. I desperately wanted to run, but something would chase me, I was sure. I didn't even check out the truck or grab the skull. As soon as I was up on the boulder that I first spotted the trail from, the feeling completely evaporated. Looking down, I couldn't see the truck or how in the world it could have gotten there. Despite the scary experience, I wanted to try again with a friend. I mean, what kid doesn't want to poke around a cool old truck? But we moved again before I had the chance to. This happened five years ago. I was putting my daughter to sleep. I was sitting next to her bed on a chair and holding her hand. There was a really small nightlight to my right, next to the window. There is no other light source. I was relaxing and sort of drifted off for a while. When I opened my eyes again, there was a sort of thick mist about 10 centimeters above the floor that was circling clockwise around the spot in the middle of the room. The mist was yellowish white, and it glowed a bit. The funny thing is that at that moment, I wasn't freaked out. I was totally relaxed, thinking how awesome and beautiful this is. I looked at my feet, and the mist was just slowly swirling past me. I remember thinking that I would probably forget it by the next morning. I do not know how much time has passed. My guess is a few minutes. I looked at my daughter, she was sound asleep, so I decided to go to bed. As soon as I moved my legs, the swirly mist shot inward at one bright small point in the middle of the room, like a tiny little light, a few millimeters in diameter, and after that, it darted toward the window and disappeared. My thoughts were only, ha, huh, interesting. And I went to bed. Next morning, I forgot all about it and remembered in the middle of the day that I would definitely forget something. And it all came rushing back to me. And at that time, I did freak out a bit. I still have no idea what that was. However, I am certain that I wasn't asleep. It was something good. And since then, I feel like something good is watching over my daughter. In our primary school, when you got to year six, the final year, you could be a ranger, which meant a sort of helper for the teachers and mentors for the younger students, usually years one and two. Helping the younger years with classwork, clearing up the equipment after PE lessons, helping the school office with simple tasks like printing, faxing, etc monitoring the stairways when kids were going down to the playground in case it got too rowdy, things like that. One afternoon, myself and three other sixth graders were putting away some equipment after a PE lesson that had taken place in the assembly hall. There was a storage cupboard there, and we were putting away some hula hoops and then decided to have some fun taking turns locking each other in, making ghost noises, and scaring each other. We had to get to our next lesson, so we finally finished putting everything away, locked the door, and then we heard a noise like equipment being shifted from inside the cupboard. We were slightly spooked, but I figured something must have just fallen. As a joke, though, I knocked on the door, and I shit you, not someone knocked back from inside. I never ran so fast in my life. The night my father passed away, I experienced something surreal. I have a craft room that I do beating in. In my craft room, I have medicine I smudge with, my smudging bowl, personal stuff like documents, etc. I also have a small urn with my grandmother's ashes and family photos. The last day I talked to my father, he was frantic and said he had bad news from his doctor and that he was scared. We said I love you, and I sent him a message around supper time, but he never opened it. My father was in failing health. 
His kidneys were shutting down, and we saw each other for the last time two weeks before the final day I talked to him. So, I was feeling really off. It was around 11 pm when I decided to go into my craft room to do some beading. Bead work and beading are therapeutic for me, and I needed something to keep my mind busy. I was feeling really off. It felt like something bad was going to happen. I didn't like how my father didn't answer me back, but I felt confident that if anything were to happen, he had his partner with him and resources like his life alert. Dad told me in our final conversation that his meds weren't working properly and that his doctor was concerned he was at risk of another stroke or heart attack, he had a stroke months prior to his kidneys failing. However, they didn't want to admit him to the hospital and send him home. So, that was that. We love our healthcare system. I remember feeling really weirded out, so I lit my smudging stuff and smudged myself in my craft room. As I was smudging, some documents I had on the table next to my grandmother's urn flew off. It was freaky. It was like a gust of wind blew them off the table, but I kid you not, I had no window open or anything like a fan going. I felt this deep, immense feeling of sadness, so I put my things away and went to bed. I had to get up early for work. I remember setting my alarm and keeping my phone volume up just in case. Dad never opened my last message, and it worried me. The next morning, I got up and went to the bathroom to get ready. When I finally looked at my phone, I had dozens of missed calls beginning at 1.38 am I never heard a single one, which was odd because I'm a light sleeper. My heart sank, and I just knew. I had multiple voicemails from my stepmother. When I called her, she answered immediately and was crying. I lost my dad due to a heart attack in his sleep on September 14th. I found out shortly after 6 am I'll never forget the sinking, icky feeling I had hours before and then the moment of the papers flying off the table where my grandmother's urn sat, it freaked me out. To make things even more nerve-wracking, on the day of my father's funeral, my old man by Zac Brown band wouldn't stop playing on repeat on my Spotify, even with shuffle enabled. I had to turn it off. It felt like my dad was saying goodbye. I miss him. My best friend in high school lived on a rural farm south of San Antonio, Texas, all private and fenced in. His family had owned that land for generations and knew every nook and cranny. As typical high school kids do, we had massive parties at his farm since the cops wouldn't mess with us out there. He and I were also always riding around, hunting, fishing, shooting guns, and generally just hanging out on the property. One summer night, we're all just hanging out shooting the shit and drinking beer around a fire when we notice around 10 to 15 men dressed head to toe in all black clothing. Black beanie, black face paint, black sweatshirt, black pants, and black boots. Just completely black everything. One of the men appeared to be wearing what looked like night vision goggles, but they were strange looking. We saw the first three men walking upright toward us, maybe 50 yards away, and then we started to see the other 7 to 10 guys crawling on their bellies towards us out of a corn field. My best friend, freaking out because people were trespassing on his family's land, went right up to one of the guys and started screaming and demanding to know what the hell they were doing there. Nothing. Complete silence. He kept berating and yelling at these men, and not one of them would even acknowledge us. That's when we started to get really creeped out. Because in our high school brains, we immediately thought we were fucked and the local cops had organized this huge sting operation to shut us down for having the massive parties, but these men were laser focused on something and wouldn't even acknowledge our presence. Eventually, they just kept marching northward through very thick brush and more cornfields until we couldn't see them anymore. To this day, we still talk about it and speculate about what the fuck that was all about. The best theory we can come up with is that it was some sort of military training exercise or something, but his farm is nowhere near any military base or installation. Okay, I'm sorry in advance, but I have quite a few, so be warned. My mother has always told me that when I was a baby, but just old enough to talk, we'd moved into our new home at the time, and my mother was holding me as she checked out one of the bedrooms, which was unfurnished and empty at the time. She says I started to smile, looking at the corner of the room and giggling as she held me and asked, Mammy, who's that old man in the corner? And she promptly booked it out of that room with me. Around 13 years ago, it was a few short days after my lovely grandpa had passed, and a few of us were in his living room, preparing everything and tidying up as you do. My dad started to remove the paper from the living room wall as it had already started crumbling, and despite being incredibly skeptical and by no means a believer in the supernatural, he stopped in his tracks and gasped. He didn't say anything, but when I looked at the wall he stared at, I saw an unmistakable, massive carving of my grandpa's silhouette. My dad was removing the wallpaper just as haphazardly as you do, and so this image was just staring at us all day. It was as if someone took a picture of my grandpa from his side profile, where he was sitting down on his favorite chair, the shape of his belly, 
his posture exactly as it was, his face, everything. It was unbelievably startling and unmistakable to every one of us in this room. I think we were all silent for minutes until we started to laugh out of pure shock and confusion. And I remember feeling him with me completely and utterly and feeling that he was okay now. He was there the whole time, sitting down on his favorite wooden carved seat and watching TV as he always did. And a little side note to my dear grandpa, as all families are, it was complicated in that we siblings only ever got to truly meet and know him within the last year of his life, despite any of us, including him, knowing it at that time, he was in very good health, it was almost as if we had all been given that last chance to know each other. It was one of the most special times of my life, getting to meet and know someone I'd always wondered about and seeing him so quickly accept us kids. I was 16 at the time, with my brother and sister being about 10 and 12, and my older sister about 20. He was always a hermit and always completely kept to himself, so to see him and my dad find peace in their relationship and to know my grandpa at the time we did meant the world to me. With that said, last year I was on holiday abroad and decided to go see a tarot reader because, why the hell not? Something I'd never done before. This amazing older Turkish woman did the reading with me, and I consciously said absolutely nothing to her about myself whatsoever, not during the booking, not during the entire appointment, I just listened to her and wanted to see what could be said or picked up from her reading. At the very end, she suddenly asked if I had a question for one person in the other life, anyone at all. This was the only time I mentioned anything personal about myself, of course. I blurted out without thinking, is my grandpa okay? At this point, it had been 12 years since he passed, and I always thought about him, but that question truly came out of nowhere for me. She responded that he was indeed, and he was so proud of me. While I know, of course, that this is a very straightforward, common response to give to anyone, I still cried big time. But then what stopped me dead in my tracks was how she immediately, without hesitation and with firm confidence, stated, he is proud of you, but you must keep writing, publish that book, and you must finish that book, she said it so sternly when I had not once mentioned anything about writing. I could have fallen over in my chair, only my partner, who hadn't met my grandpa, has ever known that I have always wanted to be a published writer, that for years and years I've picked at stories and novels I've started writing, but I keep stalling. When I properly met my grandpa when I was 16, I knew I'd never told him about my dreams to become a writer. Nothing I could have said to this woman alluded to this at all. At the time of this reading, I had about two or three attempted and half-finished writings on the go that were always on my mind. It was her confidence and how direct and firm she was. I truly knew in that moment that my grandpa was the second person in my life to know all this time that it's something I dreamed to do. I'll never forget that. When I feel most lonely in life, I remind myself of this. A few years ago, my friend sadly lost her grandma. She had decided to take over her grandma's home and live there herself shortly thereafter with her partner. About a week after her lovely nan had passed, I'd popped over to my friend's home to stay the night with her, movies, snacks, just a warm, cozy sleepover. This would have been the first time I'd been inside her grandmother's home before, but I was more focused on making sure she'd have a lovely night together with her mind taken elsewhere after such a heavy time in life. She'd swap stories about her grandmother's amazing personality, including how she was insanely feisty and energetic for her age and would tell anyone straight away without hesitation, the type you'd never mess with and always want on your side. She'd even in her later life kept a baseball bat by her bedside, ready to take down any intruders, a straight up badass. She'd mentioned how her grandmother would take her time to get to know you or suss you out, appear hard-edged initially, but would warm to you in due time, too. So that night, my first night there, we had a great few hours chilling, watching movies, and having a laugh together. About three hours into my visit, though, in her living room, a picture fell off the wall, and my friend and I shook ourselves. We laughed and didn't think anything of it, we replaced it back on the wall. I didn't say any of this, but immediately, the moment I came into the home, I felt something very strong. I felt this energy that made me want to tread lightly, which is the only way I can put it, a few minutes after the first picture fell, a second one went. My friend remarked that's never happened before, I'm now trying to keep calm. No word of a lie, in total, three pictures fell off her living room wall in front of us. Then, a few hours later, around 7 pm, there was a loud crash in the hallway. Yup, another picture fell, but this one cracked the frame. And you guessed it, we'd gone to crash in her room for the night, and on my life, another three photo frames of hers in her bedroom fell on the floor. I was burning it secretly at this point, I wouldn't have said this out loud, of course, but I was genuinely feeling an intense push to leave. Not as in fear-based, but as if someone was literally telling me to get out of JFC. And to end it all, as we fell asleep, I was half awake when I felt and heard someone breathing heavily in front of my face. As I was on the open side of the bed, 
I knew before opening my eyes that it would have meant someone would have had to be kneeling down to breathe like that so closely to me. It took me about 20 seconds to work up the courage to open my eyes, and of course, nothing was there. I'm usually dreadful about waking up early, but when I tell you the next morning, I magically became an early fucking riser and legged it post haste. A week or so later, I came back over to visit, and I immediately felt the shift in the air go from tense and suspicious to warm and relaxed, and I said a quiet, secret, thank you to her grandma for deciding I was okay. I used to have a lime green pickup truck and drove it two hours away to my sister's. It broke down about halfway. My sister told me to tow it to her friend's house, he was a backyard mechanic and could fix it. We dropped it off there and went to her house. The next day we go over to try and help him fix it. There is a guy spray painting an old car door or something in his shed, he didn't think anything of it. I found out what was wrong with it, dropped the parts off to him, and went and got lunch. After lunch, we go back there to pick it up. The truck is fixed, but no one is there anymore. While getting into the truck, I noticed a black streak on the roof of my lime green truck, which looked like fresh spray paint. I pointed it out to my wife and sister, and since no one was there, I wrote it off as damn hillbillies and left. I showed my brother-in-law when we got to their house, he saw it, said it was spray paint, and tried calling said friend to bring it up to him, but got no answer. I finished the rest of our stay there, noticing it every time I walked past the truck. After the two-hour drive home on Sunday, I got out of the truck and glanced over. It was gone, there was no evidence of spray paint, no evidence of someone cleaning it. Just gone. It baffles me still to this day where that paint went. I would say I'm crazy, but four other people have seen it too and have no idea how it disappeared. When I was in the Boy Scouts one time, I thought I saw a man holding lights in the woods. I assumed it was a car somewhere, so I ignored it. Later, I saw it a few more times. This time, he would jump to the right and disappear before reappearing later in a different spot. I knew I wasn't going crazy because two of my other friends said they had seen it, and when I told my best friend, he thought I was crazy, but the man reappeared in the woods after a while. Before I continue, this happened in a graveyard. We used to have our meetings at a church, and this man held four lights, one red, three white, and he was a black silhouette, we joked about it and made it a troop campfire story, and I was happy because me and a friend were voted as the new troop leaders the same night. It was a joke over the next few weeks, but later at summer camp we were playing manhunt, and I got separated from my group really late at night, if I had to guess 10-ish. I was on a trail in the woods when I saw him, and for about a minute I sat there staring at him, but he wouldn't leave. I picked up a rock now crying and threw it at him, and it disappeared. I ran back to the cabin, where I was lucky enough to find my team hiding behind it and win the game even though I was terrified. I went on to see them a few more times, but the sightings were much more spread over large groups of time. It's not the most interesting story, but it sends chills down my spine when I think about it. I had a family friend from whom everyone in my family bought the cars, my mom, dad, brother, and sister. It sold me my first car and a few after it. Man was an absolute legend, life of any party, kind-hearted, funny the lot, but suffered from the black dog. Unfortunately, he took his own eight or so years ago. The last car he sold me was an old BMW. It was in great shape engine-wise but needed a lot of cosmetic work, which I never really got around to. Still, because of its history, I was very reluctant to part with it, and I ended up keeping it for years longer than I should have. Eventually, though, I gave in and got a more modern car with all the bells and whistles, including a hands-free phone. Not long after buying the new car, I'm driving home from work, and who calls me over the hands-free but that family friend. Six years after he died, I thought possibly it could be one of his family members using his old phone to contact me for some baffling reason, so I pulled over and answered, static for about a minute and then deadline. The weird thing is that the call was in my phone log on the car but not on my actual phone. When I tell this story to people, I know I like to finish by saying I think it was him giving me the stamp of approval on the new car, but in reality, it was the height of COVID. My business was really struggling, I was in bits emotionally, and the head was all over the place. Whatever weird phone glitch or whatever it was that caused it, it was timely for me. In the house where I grew up, it was laid out such that you could see the back hall, mudroom, and garage entry reflected on the TV screen in the living room. I was lying on the couch one day, guessing I must have been about 14 to 15, when I heard someone come in through the garage entryway, into the mudroom area. I was home alone, but I was expecting my mom or siblings to be home in the near future, so I wasn't immediately startled. I was too lazy to get off the couch, so I just looked up at the TV and watched through the reflection into the back hall. There I saw the silhouette of someone, they seemed more like a tall man than my average height mother, so it could have been my brother. 
I watched as he looked over at me on the couch and then set down a heavy object in the back hall. It looked like a large duffel bag. My brother was in college at the time, so it was reasonable to think this could have been a weekend bag or otherwise. Again, not fully expected, but not fully unusual either. The unusual part was that, after setting down the bag or heavy object, the person then turned around and retreated back into the garage, as if to get more things from the car. I waited a few minutes for them to come back. 15 minutes must have gone by before curiosity got the better of me, and I got off the couch and made my way to the back hall to investigate this large object and ask if the person needed help unloading the car. Except there was no large object. And the garage door entry into the house was locked. And there were no cars in the garage. I was still home alone. I called my mom, she had not just been home, dropped something off without saying anything, and gone back out. Was I nuts? She wouldn't be home for another 20 to 30 minutes. My brother also had no plans to come home that weekend and was still at college. To this day, I have no explanation for what happened. A lot of weird, spooky things happened in the house in which I grew up. Calling it haunted feels like a stretch, but things definitely weren't right, either. I have lots of odd stories, but I guess I'll share this low-key one regarding both my parents. My mother passed away in 2020 at a relatively young age after a prolonged struggle with cancer. We had a complicated and challenging relationship, but she's exerted the singular biggest influence over me and given so much of herself that I will always be grateful for. At the moment of her death, I played the left bank's pretty ballerina in the hope that it would be the last thing she would listen to. She loved that song, and I always thought of it as hers without paying attention to the lyrics. I played it off her phone, this fact will be significant, as you'll soon find out. I couldn't bring myself to listen to it after that because it was too painful. Two years later, I began thinking that I wanted a divorce. The whole process of making up my mind, telling my ex, and effectively kicking him out took place exactly between my mother's birthday and death anniversary, a 10-day period. I did find that interesting. The day I moved back into my house alone, I felt very lonely and intimidated. I was playing music on the radio to console myself. At what felt like the very peak of my despair, what do you know, pretty ballerina begins to play. Just close your eyes, and she'll be there. I sat up immediately because I was so surprised. Immediately after the song ended, it was followed by the only other song I strongly associate not only with my mother but also with her single-minded love for me, dedicated to the one I love by the mamas and papas. I got chills down my spine, and this is coming from someone who doesn't really believe in the afterlife and would prefer for it not to exist. I felt like my mother had, somehow, been looking out for me and had found a way to comfort me. I'll end by mentioning another odd musical episode involving my father. I had a train wreck of a relationship with him, and we became alienated before I reached my teens. But if I'm prompted, I can retrieve happy childhood memories of us in the car singing along to Del Shannon's Runaway and doing all the wah-wah-wahs. I spent a week obsessively listening to Del Shannon in the spring of 2022, to have no idea why, as I wasn't familiar with his music other than that particular hit and hadn't been through a phase like that before. In the same week, my father passed away very suddenly. Yeah, music was kind of a big deal for my family. When I was in my teens, I and my sister were home alone for a bit. Parents were gone for the week, so it was just us and whoever we brought over after school or whatever. We're watching movies, and we start to hear, like, cupboard doors closing and stuff. So we go to the kitchen, and it's empty. Later, we hear people walking around, but there's no one there. Sometimes we'd find water spills on the counter and blame each other, but we both swore it wasn't us. When we were sleeping, sometimes our doors would crack open even when they were fully closed. Then one day, we looked outside and saw boot prints in the snow, but they just stopped at the side of the garage and disappeared. They didn't come to the door or anything. And they didn't like turning around. We looked it up, and no one ever died in our house or anything, but we're pretty sure we were haunted for a week, but the super weird thing is that it was only a week. It all stopped happening when my parents got back, so we just didn't say anything, but we kind of look at each other when we hear mystery sounds now and laugh about it a bit. My parents are religious, so we figured it was like being compelled to leave by their Bible thumping or whatever. LOL. My dad is a pastor, and when I was younger, he would take me with him to run errands for the church, etc. One night the alarm went off, which wasn't unusual because literally a big enough bug would set off the motion sensors. He checked the cameras on his phone, and nothing was odd, so he asked me if I wanted to go with him to check it out and make sure everything was good. Obviously, I went, that SHT was too fun. We got there, and the outside was fine, no broken windows, open doors, etc. So he called the alarm company and told them not to worry about sending the police. 
We went inside and were looking around. Both of us walked into the main auditorium, and plain as day, we both heard Hey Jay, which is his name. That was odd, but it was quick, so we kind of just said, oh well, it must have been a draft or something, and kept checking the rooms out to be sure. After we walked through the whole building, he was resetting the alarm so we could leave, and we heard one of the bathroom stall doors slam shut. We were right outside the bathroom, so we would have seen if someone went in or was going to come out. He went into the bathroom, and no one was there. Nothing. We just shrugged it off, and he set the alarm, and we left and never really talked about it again. That was probably 10 years ago, and I really don't believe in ghosts, the paranormal, whatever, but I still get chills when I think about it. I was walking alone around 11 pm on an early winter evening. I lived in a town with large swaths of forested land between neighborhoods. I turned a corner in one such place, and there was a little girl standing alone under a streetlight. She was crying and was quite clearly terrified. She was only wearing a light sweater over a t-shirt and a pair of slacks. Her boots were clearly too large for her. She let me walk her home, but she wouldn't say much in between sobs. What little she did say was unintelligible with her crying. She gestured towards a road not far off my own path, and we set off. Soon, she got really quiet. I spoke with her once in a while. Sometimes she'd just keep walking, staring ahead. Sometimes she would just turn and look at me. She never spoke, nodded, or said anything that could be construed as a response. She let me lay my coat over her for a bit. Looking at her in detail, I'd have guessed she was no more than six or seven. The sleeves of my coat dragged in the slush. We got to a house with no lights on. She went to the door, and I stood there to watch her go in. I imagined a warm welcome and lots of crying. I imagined her parents might be frantically searching for her around town. I watched this little girl go straight through the door. She walked through the slab and glass as if they weren't there. No lights were turned on. There was no reaction from inside. That's when I realized there wasn't a single footprint along the driveway and footpaths she'd taken. I froze in shock for a while, and eventually I went home. The only evidence I had from my encounter was the wet and dirty cuffs of my coat sleeves. I'm not sure this qualifies, but I've had a recurring, apocalyptic dream ever since I was young. It often begins the same way but ends up going in various different directions as I flee an attacking army that's invading our town. In one of the variations of this dream, myself and my wife met up with a family that offered us some food. They used the word halal to describe the meal, which was explained to me in the dream as being similar to kosher. And, upon waking up, I googled the word and saw that this definition wasn't too far off. I thought that was kind of interesting, so I called my aunt and began telling her the story, but she stopped me as soon as I mentioned the apocalyptic dreams. Apparently she has very similar dreams, and they begin exactly like mine. She's standing in the driveway of her childhood home, and fighter jets are flying over the house, going east to west as they launch an attack on the town. The crazy thing is, it's the same exact house in the same town. After all, I was raised by my grandparents, so I grew up in her childhood home. I always thought that was freaky, and to this day, I've got no real explanation for it. I went hiking on a trail that is well known, so seeing other hikers or mountain bikers is not uncommon. While I was walking up the trail, I happened to come across this girl who seemed kind of out of place, like she was not quite dressed right for hiking but not totally in the wrong attire either. As I get closer, about 10 to 15 feet, I call out, hey, how's going? Half to let her know I was behind her so I didn't surprise her when I caught up, and half because she was really cute. She looks back and says, not too bad, how about yourself? I catch up to her, telling her not to have bad weather for hiking. As we walk up this trail, we chat, and she is a very giggly person. We continue talking and walking for 10 minutes or so when she stops me and says, you want to see a meadow I found before? It's kind of off the beat trail, but it's really pretty to see. Now normally I wouldn't follow some stranger into the woods because who knows how far to find a meadow that may or may not really be there, but I'll admit I was charmed by her. She was very attractive and fit my idea of a perfect girl, and she was also short, like 5 feet 1 inch or 5 feet 2 inches, so I wasn't really afraid of her. I said, yeah, sure, we've got plenty of daylight to get back. Let's go. She throws her hands up and goes, who, let's go. She grabs my hand and pulls me into the woods. As I bumble through the woods, she is ahead of me, dancing through the woods, hiding behind trees, and peeking out the other side. She then laughs and keeps going on. Thinking back, why it never occurred to me that this girl is gracefully bounding through the woods like a deer while I'm stumbling through like a drunken prom date, I'll never know. We've been going through the woods for about 20-ish minutes now, and I can see the trees start to thin out, 
and beyond that is an empty field about 20 yards away, so I pick up my pace and catch up to her. I'm about six feet from her when she says, come on, just pass this tree. She looks at me and steps behind the tree like she has been doing during this woods walk, so I run to the tree and say, let's see if we pick the same side to jump out, ready go. And she's gone. There is no where this girl could have gone once past that tree because on the other side was the open field. I've never had a cold spike of fear hit me so hard before. I was freaking the fuck out. My heart was pounding, hair on my body was standing on end, and I was sweating. I was scared so bad that I was frozen for what felt like forever. Then I heard her fucking giggle and turned around and ran so fast that Eugene Bolt couldn't catch me. How I found my way back to the trail is beyond me, but even after I hit the trail, I didn't stop running. I ran back down the trail until I started seeing black specks from lack of oxygen. I've told this to four people, and only one believed me, but more so in the manner of, yeah, man, totally. I believe now that we can go back to being normal.